Hello and welcome to the show. This is the Goodwin Podcast and I am Nico Lapalusa, your host. And today we're trying something different. I have no idea why. I have no idea if it's going to work. I have no idea if I'll be able to divide my attention properly, but we're going to try anyway. So today I'm doing a live stream on TikTok and hope to answer some questions as people have them. Um all the while filming and recording episode number 31 of the Goodwin Podcast, which can be found on Spotify, Apple, Pandora, YouTube, pretty much every place that you can find a podcast, you can find the Goodwin. Insert intro music. Still need intro music. But today, while we get while we wait for people to get on the live and start to ask questions, I want to talk about something that is so radically and fucking important that I just hope I find the words to do it justice. And I'll just keep talking until maybe the words do come out. But it's, it's just something that's so clear to me. And it's, it's more clear with age um, and maybe the history that I've had. Um, and for those of you who don't know, I'm going to preface this by saying I, I had a the disease of being a romantic. And yes, I say it like that because romanticism, it's just been misconstrued into this ugly thing. And it it was very much for me. I was a helpless romantic. And what that meant was I lived most of my life in desperation in constantly seeking external validation, and by doing so, pushing people away in the meantime. Which, you think that romanticism helps you bring, like, brings you closer with people, but it had the exact opposite effect. I had a disease of romanticism, and this is what I want to talk about today. And I hope you stick along for the ride. And if you are tuning in live on on TikTok, please uh, feel free to drop questions to keep the conversation going or or I'll just keep going. And I swear, God, I think I just saw my good friend Lucky pop in the chat. And okay, a little side note before we get into the disease of romanticism. Part of TikTok for me has been the anonymity of it. I... I liked TikTok at the beginning because, yo, what's up, Luck? I liked TikTok at the beginning because I could post completely unabashed because I pretty I was pretty sure that no one I knew was going to see it. And now that there's been a few videos that have gained popularity, I've noticed that people are actually seeing it like from high school and from and from college and whatnot. So I guess that's just the immediate what's going on in my mind. I, I liked the anonymity of TikTok and like posting to people that I didn't ex- that didn't know my history and didn't know my past and didn't know how m- much of a weirdo or loser I was growing up um, in certain aspects. And uh, and now that's changing. So now I have to change with that. So the disease of romanticism to get to not leave you guys too much on a cliffhanger because it is just. Look, okay, there is no such thing as a soulmate. There. There you go. It's all wrapped up in a little bow. There's no... There's not the one for you. Okay? There's not. And there's probably a little bit of resistance coming up. There's probably a little bit of resistance to the fact that... Like... It's not nihilistic, this principle, and I'll explain why. There's no such thing as a soulmate, the soulmate, or the one for you. Now, there are many people that are good for you. There are many people that you'll be compatible with that will be able to show you love. And there are many people that are bad for you. And there are many people that won't be able to serve or, or, you know, receive your love, whatever. But I want to go further. This, this is destructive. It's, it's destructive on a few levels to just be caught up in the notion that there are, that there are soulmates. And I mean soulmate in the definition that 
like there is a person you're meant to meet and that person and you will help, you know, will help bring you up to a, to new heights and heal you so that you'll go to heaven or that you'll, you know, become Ashton Kutcher in the next life or whatever your perception of after whatever it is. And it's just it, it's there there's just many people that you'll be compatible with that you'll be attracted to. And I want to talk about the problem with with soulmates and the over romanticization if that's a word romanticization which happens because what would happen is I would become infatuated right I would think based on even the smallest shit like I'd I'd meet someone and then I'd run into them again on campus or we'd make eye contact in a in, a, in whatever way they would say something that resonated with me and I'd be like this is the one wow, this is the one, this is the person, and I would dedicate my attention and focus on them. And what that would end up doing is pushing them away. That's the, that's jumping to the end. But basically, I would idealize this person, I would, I would put them on a pedestal. And by doing this, if they sense that, and they just know they're going to be able to let you down. When you bring someone up so much, the only way to go is down. And that's that's truly like a repellent to be admired in such a way. And frankly, women don't want that. And I'm pretty sure men don't either. And I'm going to try not to get into the gendering when I don't need to gender. But... There's a destructive quality to overly idealizing, to believing in soulmates. And yes, it does come off. It can come off as desperate. But really, it doesn't feel desperate in the moment. And that's the tricky part. It's It feels like love. It feels like it's kind of the area where love and want kind of meld into one because the serotonin and the, and the, and the feelings are just so strong. And... We're going to go on a lot of tangents today, but partially, like what I like about the Spanish language is they have, I think, three, maybe four ways of saying I love you. And one of the ways of saying I love you is te quiero, which literally translates to I want you. And I think that's that's a nice way of introing into love because take care can be used for like newer relationships for friendships or um, it might even be more appropriate like in sex like if you're with someone that you that you're trusting and that you and that you are have that infatuating feel with they're kicking on your serotonin and you're having some good sex or even some bad sex but they're making you feel good and you know, you I'm in English, you'd be like, I love you. Damn, I love you. But what I really mean to say is, fuck, I want you. You are like, you're turning me on. You're turning me on in all sorts of places, mentally, physically, and emotionally. Like, and I want you and I want to keep wanting you. So the distinction between infatuation and connection, which was, which was, um, put in the chat I think that distinction has to be made and this soulmate or there is one person for me propagates this infatuate this infatuation behavior this over idealizing someone where the only way you're pigeonholing them so that the only place they can go is down and that's a good point and I really do like this live feed I'm going to feed off this a lot because there are people that you'll connect with there are tons of people that you'll connect with and there are some people that will even be special in your life and meeting them will feel magical and i'm not trying to dismiss like divinity or sovereignty or synchronization or the mystery of the world that's not what i'm trying to do at all because i don't know i'm not audacious enough to say that i know the workings of the world in terms of God and what God is and what God isn't, you know, I can kind of poke at some of these things and things do seem to happen for a meaning, but to meet someone more often than not to meet someone 
and to have the notion, the preconceived notion of soulmates and that someone out there is going to save you or lift you up in a way, it ends up being destructive. And more often times than not, the lesson ends, turns into humility. And it turns into, oh, what I'm seeking is not actually outside myself. The connection and the, and the love is actually something I have to cultivate and work at in myself so that I can enjoy the connection with another. And so we can rise together. Because there is such a thing as meeting someone and being on a team and building each other up. But you can't put that first. You can't put, like no one's, no one's going to do that for you. you. You have to do the work yourself and then you can bring that to someone and then together you kind of rise up. It's a literally giving to, to get type of situation. And I missed some of the comments here. But what about twin flames, divine masculine and, and divine feminine? So I'm not fully sure what twin flames are. I think if you wanna if you wanna go into that, but I'm pretty sure there are people that it feels good to meet, and there are people that are special in your life. There's no doubt about that. And I would never try to take away like a special, a feeling of, of a, like speciality between a relationship. What I'm talking about is making someone, one person, a soulmate or the, the, your direct access point to feelings of divinity or higher living. Another tangent, like this is, this is a big criticism I have about, about, the practices of religion not religion itself at its core with the principles and the foundations of of forgiveness and and uh, unconditional love but what christianity has done in a lot of ways to pick on it because that's where i was raised is they made a priest right and the priest has his back to the wall right like a king like a king the priest has a back to the wall and all the messaging is you go to the priest so that you can have your, so you can talk to the divine. The priest is a middleman for your divinity. And that is a huge error, a huge error of spiritual practices. And I think this is more known now. Um, but you are your access point. You are the access point to your divinity. And whenever you're putting someone in between, yourself and, and even your goals if we if we want to take it less macroscopic if it doesn't have to be spiritual or divine I mean, whenever you put someone in between you and your happiness or your financial success it's just a little bit more tricky it's just a little bit further off from the truth which is that you are the person that you need and by working on yourself and your own self-esteem and your own self-worth, you're going to cultivate relationships. You're going to contribute to relationships that can feed you back. So there's the inherent, there's a problem with, with soulmates and the over romantic, like romantic comedies and early Disney movies. I mean, early, if lucky, if you're still here, my friend Lucky, uh, we I went to college with with him, and we did a little bit of LSD, and we turned on like Disney's Fantasia, and I remember watching it. And if you watch the original Fantasia, it's like, uh, yo, what's up, Luck? <laughs> I hope you remember this. <laughs> like, first off, it's kind of cool, right? Disney's Fantasia, but the guy narrating it is like a super Nazi, for lack of a better word. And I remember watching it with, with my friend Lucky, who's a African American, and, and and like feeling the pain, like having watched Fantasia many times, it's just like it never registered to me, of course, because I hadn't feel like it just felt sticky, you know, and uncomfortable, and I kind of forget my point there. There's something about soulmates. 
so there's a further there's a further problem with with the soulmate mentality because it doesn't disappear after you stop being single because what it can also do is it it can trap you in a relationship that's not serving you because you're afraid of losing the one or of the one that got away when you buy into this soulmate mentality and you find a person that you deem your soulmate you have now raised them up you've now put them in between your happiness your divinity and your and yourself so now there's a codependency that's inherent in doing this and if that person senses this one it causes resentment so if they treat you like sh- if they keep treating you like shit or if it exacerbates it, i'm not saying it's their fault or they're a bad person it's just that you're putting them in a position to fail and when you feel that and when they feel that or when i feel that I, I want to resist and push back. And so I might even put, build a higher wall. Even though someone thinks they're lifting me up by pedestaling me or idealizing me, I want to put up a, a barrier because I know I'm going to let them down and I know I'm, I'm going to go from hero to villain. You know, people build up so that they can cut down. That's, that's a common theme in, in like celebrity or, or relationships. So what this over-idealization does is it can keep you trapped in a codependent relationship. It can keep you trapped in a a relationship that's ultimately not serving you. So what I think it's important is to adopt the mentality that, yes, this person that I'm with may be special. My wife, my girlfriend is truly, truly special. And what... And God for like, but there are many special people out there. I'm not bound. I'm not a prisoner to this particular relationship. To break the the cycle of codependency is not being alone. To break codependency means that you're making room for a relationship where there's mutual respect, where there's reciprocity. Where there's symb- symbiot- like symbiosis. It's, and it's highly important. That's why I really want to talk about it. To drop this overly romantic, this overly romantic ideal. And maybe I go into a little bit of how I've gotten over or the disease of romanticism that I had and then overcoming that. Um, I, the story was something like this. It's like, Man, every girl that I really like doesn't like me back. I'd say stuff like that. I'd be like, every girl I really like doesn't like me back. Because, and and this is the reason why, I believe. Like, I would become infatuated. I would create an overly idealistic person that they ultimately weren't even. You know, they would all of a sudden be the perfect, most pretty, funny Oh my God, I've never intellectually connected with, a, with a, a person like this. They must be the one. And I'd lift them up and give them all my attention making and therefore making myself small, right? Making them the prize instead of making myself a prize, which is not a perfect metaphor because it's, it implies possession, but making my building my own self-worth i'd put all of all of my sense of worthiness into them and you'd think that that would make them feel good but it had the opposite effect because it it would it would set them up for failure and they can feel it even if they didn't feel it consciously they would feel it subconscious subconsciously so The answer is always building up with relationships is always building up your own sense of self-worth. It's the gift of a breakup is you get to reflect on yourself and therefore you get to eventually learn from your mistakes and hopefully apply them moving forward. So I would overly romanticize these girls and I would and I would fall in love like every month too. 
whatever that is, that might be a, I don't, I don't, I'm not, a, I can't really analyze my past in a way to unpack it right now. Um, but I would fall in love. I would try to like be romantic, write poems, hold boom boxes, you know, outside their dorm room. And it would cause them to repel. And I'd be like, oh man, every girl I like just doesn't, doesn't like me. <laughs> Someone just asked me my thoughts on Adam Frank, and I'll try to incorporate that into the, uh, into the podcast. For those of you just tuning in, we're doing a live podcast right now, the Goodwin Podcast, which is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple. And um, this is episode number 31. And the questions that I will uh, jot down are my thoughts on Anne Frank and uh, communism. Yeah, so I'd create these unrealistic expectations of these women that barely knew me and when I did see them, I would, you know, make myself small and who would want, who wants to be with that? You know, what I didn't know then, I don't want to say fucking confidence. God damn it. Because everyone going through every shitty friend you've ever had, who, when you're not, when you're in that stage of life where you having trouble uh, picking up women or picking up or being with men or whatever it is, it's like, oh, you need confidence, you know, or be yourself. There's truth in that, but you, it's not practical. And the practicality of confidence is, I became confident in certain things. Obviously, I'm, I'm not confident in everything. That would be ridiculous, maybe narcissistic, and maybe uh, delusional, right? But where I've, where I've achieved a sense of confidence is, listening to myself and finding out what I really like. What do I keep showing up for? What kind of magazine, what kind of books do I just gravitate towards? What kind of YouTube clips am I gravitating for? Towards. So that's how I, I start to learn what I like. And I spent a lot of my 20s tasting a lot of different things. Do I like this? Do I like this? Do I like this? Um, so what do I like answers the question of like, where can I give my energy to? Okay, step one. So where do I give my energy to? Then I show up for that thing that I like time and time again. I learned that I love music. A lot of people like, everyone either likes music or loves music. I happen to love it. It's some sort of fucking key to my emotions and it gives me clarity. It brings me joy in a way that, I don't know, few things do. It's, it's one of a kind. I love music. So how do I show up for that? I know I love it now. So I, I play the guitar. I play the hand drum. I'm learning how to sing. You know, just for myself. Just for myself. But learning... So this meant that I wouldn't share music with anyone for three years because I didn't yet cultivate the, cop, the confidence. Confidence, my point, is cultivated. I have a little a sense of confidence in jujitsu. After five years of going... And showing up because something kept bringing me back. I kept, I got injured, but I, I returned because I genuinely liked it. The things that you genuinely like, you may, you'll come back to and keep returning to these things. If you love weed, if you love fucking house music, if you love video games, like I think there's a problem with that. People find what they love, but they don't go far. They don't go far enough into what they love. People, people say, I love video games, but they say it with a sense of guilt or shame. Like, yeah, I like video games. Like, or I love, you know, weed or like tobacco, but, um, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to quit. No, fuck you. If you love tobacco, I want to see you grow tobacco. Like, lo if you love tobacco, love fucking tobacco and watch where you go from there. You know, Throw that shame out fucking instantly. That's not even going to help you overcome the thing if you're trying to overcome it. So I think like go deeper pretty much. So building confidence, we figure out what we like. We show up for what we like, even on the days that are sticky. And I don't really have showing up is sometimes the hardest thing. And you're going to have to it'll be like disciplines cultivated like confidence. So you have to figure out a way to show up on the days. 
show up on the days that you don't want to. It's usually just starting because the days I don't want to practice the guitar because I'm not that good, right? And I listen to amazing musicians and I'm like, well, fuck me, right? I started guitar at 27. What are my chances of getting through? Like all those doubts come in. But really, as soon as I sit down and put the guitar on my lap and play an A minor, it's like, okay, I can do this for a while. So confidence, right? Is And this relates back to what we were talking about with working on yourself, making yourself the prize so that you don't overly romanticize another, hence pushing them away, hence building resentment in them so that they can't reciprocate affection. If you're just tuning in, that's what we've been talking about is the false narrative of soulmates and the false narrative of there's only one person for you. There's one special person for you in the world. There are many special people in the world for you. There are many good people for you in the world. And there's also bad people for you in the world. And you'll start to understand the distinction and you'll start to be able to differentiate that as you build your own sense of worth. Because you'll know how much love you are, you should be getting, how much love you deserve, how much love you're able to give, and therefore you'll be able to receive. Um, to answer your question, Norb, I'm. this is a podcast, episode number 31 of the Goodwin Podcast, and it is available uh, everywhere you can find podcasts. This will be available a little bit later. So yes, I'll, I'll post it, but I, I think it's this one's coming out January 2nd. Sorry. Okay, so the false narrative of of soulmates and someone I think asked about post honeymoon phase. Someone asked like the person you fell in love with ends up not being you know, something happens around 6 months or a year or 2 years. And that correlates very well with this soulmate mentality. Because when, when we enter with the soulmate mentality, we can call it an overly romantic mentality. And we're building someone up. Like I said, we're building them up. We're putting them on a pedestal. We're idealizing them. The only way to go is down. We're putting them in a double bind that eventually will get let down. Some people say you don't meet, want to meet your heroes. They can only let you down. But this is true only if you've overly romantic, if you don't, if you don't fully embrace the humanness of them. If you build your expectations to a point where you think that they're a certain way, that they're inevitably going to let you down because they're inevitably just going to show their humanness. And we do this in relationships a lot where we found the one. This is someone I'm going to dedicate myself to. And we, every, we love everything about them. Oh my God, how she snorts when she shits. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. When she snorts when she laughs. Like, uh, um, that's, so, that's so awesome. Or, you know, the little sound she makes when she's biting her nails. Oh, I like that. Well, guess what? You're idealizing. And maybe that sound she makes when she's biting your nails could be if you overly idealize it, it's like, oh, this is what drives me fucking insane. This is a, this is like a compulsive behavior. And every time I hear the sound of her biting her nails, I'm triggered. You know, so you're you're gonna set yourself up for the fall with this disease of romanticism. And look, that's that's super harsh, right? Because I'm not saying don't write poetry. I'm not saying don't make you know songs. Don't take your significant other out for a picnic or whatever's romantic these days to a a protest or the presidential campaign. Whatever's romantic. I'm not saying that. You're going to do that. But when as soon as you lower yourself and sacrifice your authenticity to please, to please so that you can, so that someone will like you, it's just going to crumple. It's going to crumple.
so someone's commented, Lord, Lord Tom one said, maybe that's what's wrong with me. I don't commit or dedicate myself to a, a relationship. So that's actually like a really solid and timely counterpoint, I find, because what's the opposite of overly romanticizing is overly guarding yourself, right? So maybe it's a good time to identify the sweet spot by acknowledging the, the like the opposite, right? Because it's not about throwing romanticism out the window. Like I said, it's 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 about authentically expressing romantic and, and even infatuatory behavior when you feel it. It's about compromising when it's a good time to compromise. Not always compromising to make the other person like you, which I was a serial co- like compromiser, serial compromiser. Um, oh, never. And I was like, I never want to create waves. I just want, yeah, peace. You know, I can go with the flow. I, I would, I don't mind. And I didn't mind a lot of times. Or that's, that's the story I told, told myself. But then if you always do that, if you set yourself up in this situation, you're going to find that it's not reciprocated and you're really belittling yourself over and over again. So the compromise <laughs> to over compromising or, or I'm sorry, the contrast to, to compromising is never compromising, right? And you can see how neither of these are going to work. If you never compromise, if you're never able to commit yourself to a relationship, then that too is going to fail you. An inability to commit to anything is is going to fail you because maybe this is a good time to talk about the beauty of commitment, which is not hip is not a hypocrisy, because we know that things aren't black and white; that there is a middle way, and we're just trying to set up the bumpers to stay to find a middle path. But uh, there's a beauty in commitment that happens when I know when I started to realize the things that I want to do for the rest of my life when I would show up for these things, when I would show up to practice these things, I would enjoy them more. There wouldn't be a sense of urgency with these things. I wouldn't have to get anywhere. I could enjoy it and give myself time to do so. And okay, I haven't talked about Anne Frank yet. If you guys are still here, I haven't talked about communism or go- and now someone asked me about government. So I'm going to try to tie that all in. And there's a beauty to commitment. That's all that's all I'm going to say. So we have to figure out how to commit and when to commit and and when to not and okay, we have to figure out how to commit without over idealizing someone so that we're making ourselves small. And fuck, and Frank, how does she tie into all this? Well, she ties in a little bit to government and communism. I think the there's this is how I want to answer the question. There, there is a f- another f- another false narrative besides the soulmate false narrative that's been pushed, and that's the narrative of mandatory competition or scarcity. Like, and this is probably even, it, you can even fall into logical pitfalls where scarcity or overpopulation is another way to say scarcity. Conservationalism is another way to say scarcity. And look, if you're going to take a clip of something I say and run with it, you're going to miss the point. Because there's not nothing to conservationalism. There's not nothing to protecting waters and land and from people dumping shit into them now there's this narrative there's no real better sense of of control of government control than fear and the creation of scarcity 
Just like it's wrong to put someone between you and divinity, like a priest, or you and your happiness, like your significant other, putting someone in between you and your ability to eat, clothe yourself, create shelter, is also, there's going to be pitfalls, there's going to be, it's going to fail you as well. And I don't want to say this with being overly idealistic, humans are meant to be in a community. And managing community dynamics is important. And there is, you know, we do want paved roads. We do want someone to come to our house if it's on fire and help us. So I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. But anytime someone is putting themselves between you and your life, liberty, or the pursuit of happiness, you're going to find a sense of resentment. You're going to find a sense of at least confusion. And this is not a place where I'm giving you answers because I don't fucking have them, unfortunately. And fortunately. But this... What I can say about government is, is there ways that you can lower your dependency, increase your self-responsibility, increase your ability to control the things that you can control in your life? Is there a way? I don't know. You know, if you live in an apartment building in the middle of New York, for me to say, yeah, grow your own food, raise your own chickens, that doesn't seem like good advice. That seems overly idealistic, but that might be the right advice for someone, right? Like if you can have five chickens and they give you four egg, an average of four eggs a day, if you can grow some vegetables and learn canning, I mean, it's not going to be devoid of effort, right? But people did survive without the imposition of government as we know it for we had hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years before government as we know it. And there is clearly, clearly, clearly an agenda. <laughs> That's a trigger. Easy, stay with me. There is something about creating a sense of scarcity, about creating a sense of fear, to swayed people's decisions and to have power over them. I feel like I'm constantly qualifying myself, which I don't really like, but I don't, but another one is power is not a dirty word. The villain, the vilification, is that a fucking word too? The vilifying of power is an attempt to get power. Do you see that? Is that seen? How saying, how constantly saying someone is evil or something is evil, one can empower it, but also can make you become the thing you're fighting. Have you witnessed this pattern before? This, this happens with power a lot too, and government. And I think a lot of these questions about government and communism and maybe Anne Frank, who I'm still working, trying to work into this podcast somehow. Um, it's a, it's about, it's kind of an attempt to being like, well, government's the problem because they have too much power. And I like to reframe the definition of power being the ability to control your own life. That's the most simple form. Obviously, there's things that we can't control in life. There is a, a sense of mystery to the world. But of the things that you can control, how much of them are you controlling? How much responsibility for those things are you, are you able to take? Are you taking? That's your kind of sense of maturity. That's kind of your sense of power. And this is cultivated through things like self, building your self-esteem and knowing who you are and knowing what you're capable of. So if you want, I, I feel like if you want to lower your resentment of government, your resentment of the powers that be, you can do simple things 
that might not be so simple, but they're simple in principle, like figure out a way to grow food, make food, to harvest food, or figure out a tr- some way. To, some way, there is a way to figure out how to get or make food through trade, barter, or through the earth, which still exists. I'm, I'm almost talking like I'm assuming people are in cities, but there's no reason for me to assume that. If you live anywhere outside of a city, you know that there's, there's earth around. And there's places that you can grow and cultivate food. This will help you lower your resentment of, of government. Is by taking the control, taking the power that you're able to. Autonomy, yes. Reclaiming your autonomy, exactly. I, f- I feel like my whole 20s have been learning how to reclaim autonomy. And I started out my 20s with a fistful of, res- a belly full of resentment. And I wonder, I mean, I, I, I'm sure it still lives, but I just don't feel it day to day. Like a sense of resentment. And I'm not even perfectly autonomous. Like I, I like I'm not saying be an, a lone wolf. Like part of autonomy is learning how to create symbiosis in community, is learning how to fucking love one another, which is, fucking love one another, learn how to love one another, and that's part of autonomy too. And that's part about increasing your self-worth. Let's let's do some questions. Like they can take your crops away if they want to, you know? <sighs> yes, but in the situation we are in right now, no one's taking your crops away. You know? I feel like in this... You know, because like it's not just the future, this like terrible future. Because like, oh, Anne Frank, like the Nazis, you know, they did take your power away. And and what I kind of want to point to, how old am I? I'm 31. How I want to point to is a book by Viktor Frankl, who a man search for meaning. And Viktor Frankl was a psychologist who was put into Auschwitz, and he wrote a book. He survived Auschwitz somehow in a good way, and he wrote a book. And I recommend this book. It's not very long, but it's very powerful. Viktor Frankl, A Man's Search for Meaning. And he said that even in prison, in a concentration camp, desperately searching for where was his power, right? How much more powerless can you feel in prison? I don't know. I don't know personally, but again, pointing to Viktor Frankl's book. And he said that he found a trend that people who were able to cultivate a sense of purpose, it could be called hope, but he doesn't call it hope. He, He basically said the people that were able to identify the power that they still had, even in the bleakest of circumstances, in a concentration camp. There were people who still understood that no matter what the Nazis took from them, they could still, even for a moment, see the beauty in the world around them. I, again, this is kind of hard for me to say not having been imprisoned but I recommend this book entirely. He would talk about like being forced into labor, slave labor in, in the concentration camps. And in the mornings, like as the sun was rising, pausing for a moment just to see the beauty of the sunrise. So in that way, he still found power, his, what he could control, and he contributed to that sense, uh, that cultivating that sense of power which couldn't be taken away from him. And according to him, this was part of the reason that he was able to survive these terrible, terrible conditions. (sighs) 
Okay, Jam Lamb 03. This is a podcast. Today I decided to do a live stream with a podcast. This is episode number 31 of the Goodwin Podcast. The Goodwin Podcast can be found on anywhere podcasts can be found. Apple, Spotify, YouTube. And this episode won't be aired till January 2nd because I have a backlog of them and um, it's best to release them every three days. And I'm, my production out has been exceeding my output. So apologize for that, but stay tuned. There's some other good shit, uh, that good wind that we talk about. And so just to wrap it up today, we talked about how there's no such thing as a soulmate. And not that there's not many special people in your life and there's not people that will love you and be very important to you and help you on this journey. But we talked about the pitfalls of overly romanticizing, overly idealizing others so that, the, so that they build resentment towards you and can't reciprocate. And and uh, yeah, and we talked about some ways to build self-worth and how that contributes to posit, building positive relationships in your life. We talked about ways to lower your resentment towards government and to reclaim your power. Um, and then we talked a little bit about Anne Frank and Viktor Frankl and concentration camps. So this was a, a really cool episode and I really liked this live streaming of it. I, um, you're welcome, Ekram. Um, I really liked the live streaming. I hope it kind of plays back well. And uh, I look forward to kind of watching this episode back myself and seeing and seeing what's good, seeing what's good with it and seeing what uh, what's not. Um, any other book recommendations? This will be the final question before we sign off. Uh, I can tell you books that affected me, and I wonder if they'll do the same for you. So Victor Frankl, A Man's Search for Meaning, is pretty much a staple, right? Um, I liked A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. It's a little more metaphysical, right? If you tend to appear, uh, have like a very logical bias, um, you, you'll have to figure that one out. But it really helps you kind of see a little bit about the ego and, and the motivations uh, that you have on a psychological level. And Taking the Leap by Pima Chodron is coming to mind right now. I haven't read that book in 10 years, so uh, I wonder if, you know, what it's all about and how I'd react to it now. And and the um, Alan Watts. Okay, so the th four books that I, I said was Victor Frankl's A Man's Search for Meaning, Eckhart Tolle's A New Earth, Pima Chodron's Taking the Leap, and Jordan Peterson is a nice... Yeah, I, I like some of the stuff he says a lot. So you can get into him too. Thank you so much for everyone for being here. Thank you for watching. And uh, this has been The Good Wind.